Welcome to Music History Monday for April 17th, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is I Left My Nerve in San Francisco. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the final San Francisco performance on the evening of Tuesday, April 17th, 1906, 117 years ago today, of the great Italian tenor Enrico Caruso, 1874-1921. That performance at the no longer extant Grand Opera House at No. 2 Mission Street between 2nd and 3rd Streets was not intended to have been Caruso's last local appearance, but circumstances beyond his control assured that it was. Enrico Caruso Caruso was born into a poor family in Naples, Italy, on February 24, 1874. He was the third of seven children, and not the 19th of 21, as Caruso himself often claimed. Following in the professional footsteps of his father, Marcellino Caruso, who was a mechanic Young Enrico was apprenticed to a mechanical engineer at the age of 11. He discovered his voice singing in the church choir, and as a teenager he made a few extra dinero singing on the streets and in the cafes of Naples. At the age of 18, Caruso had something of a revelation when he used money he had earned as a singer to buy his first new pair of shoes. Realizing his real professional potential, he began taking voice lessons and his progress was rapid. The 21-year-old Caruso made his professional debut as an opera singer on March 15, 1895, when he sang in a now-forgotten opera entitled L'Amico Francesco by Mario Morelli at Naples' Teatro Nuovo. He proceeded to pay his dues, singing a wide variety of roles in various provincial opera houses while continuing his vocal studies. He made his La Scala debut at the age of 26 on December 26, 1900, singing Rodolfo in Giacomo Puccini's La Boheme under the baton of Arturo Toscanini. Caruso quickly became a fan favorite throughout Italy, but it was technology, a brand new technology, that made him world famous. On April 11, 1902, Caruso walked into a hotel room in Milan, which had been outfitted as a makeshift recording studio. On that day, for a fee of 100 pounds sterling, Caruso recorded ten discs, becoming in the process the first opera singer to make a flat disc 78 RPM record. Now, for our information, those records were made for Emil Berliner's The Gramophone Company. Founded in London in 1898, The Gramophone Company was the parent company of the record label his Master's Voice, or HMV, which was the American affiliate of the Victor Talking Machine Company. The Victor Talking Machine Company was acquired by RCA in 1929, and the new label was initially known as RCA Victor. In London, in a separate transaction, His Master's Voice, merged with the Columbia Gramophone Company in 1931 to create Electric and Musical Industries Limited, better known as the classical labels EMI and Angel. 
The records Caruso recorded in that Milanese hotel room made him an overnight sensation. Just weeks after they were released, Caruso was signed to sing at London's Covent Garden. He made his Metropolitan Opera debut in a new production of Giuseppe Verdi's Rigoletto on November 23, 1903, and from that day forward became the Met's most popular tenor. It was as a member of the Metropolitan Opera Company that Enrico Caruso came to perform in San Francisco, California on April 17, 1906. San Francisco. When it came to entertainment, San Francisco audiences particularly loved opera. And while the San Francisco Opera, as it exists today, wasn't founded until 1923, the city was a major destination for the traveling troops that crisscrossed the country at the turn of the 20th century. In 1906, one of those troops was none other than the Metropolitan Opera Company, which had packed up its singers, orchestra players, staff, music, sets, props, instruments, and costumes, and gone on tour. After performing in Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Pittsburgh, Chicago, St. Louis, and Kansas City, the company crossed the Great Divide and arrived in San Francisco, where they performed Georges Bizet's Carmen on the evening of April 17, 1906, 117 years ago today. The appearance of the Metropolitan Opera was the musical and social event of San Francisco's season. That April 17th performance of Carmen was held at the magnificently appointed Grand Opera House at Number 2 Mission Street. The 34-year-old tenor Enrico Caruso, by 1906, very simply the most famous opera singer in the world, played the role of Don Jose. The almost equally famous soprano, Olive Fremstad, 1871-1951, sang the role of Carmen. The performance was a triumph. Caruso, who was staying at the Palace Hotel just a few blocks from the Opera House, remembered, quote, I had a room on the fifth floor, and on Tuesday evening I went to bed feeling very contented. I had sung in Carmen that night, and the opera had gone with fine éclat. We were all pleased, and as I said before, I went to bed that night feeling happy and contented." Unquote. He certainly didn't wake up the next morning of April 18, 1906, feeling particularly happy or contented. April 18th. I have a particular affection for the date, April 18th. Yes, I know this post is presumably about a musical event that took place on April 17th. Bear with me. We would, for a moment, list a few of the auspicious events to have taken place on April 18th. On April 18th of the year 796, King Ethelred of Northumbria, hey, Dude was the son of Ethelwald and Ethelthrith, no less, was assassinated in the northern English town of Corbridge. The assassins were led by two of his eldormen, Old English for elder men, meaning high-ranking royal officials, named Ildred and Wada. Bad people, both. On a more recent note, it was on the evening of April 18th, 1775, that the silversmith Paul Revere rode through the Massachusetts countryside crying, the British are coming. It was on April 18th, 1923, that the original Yankee Stadium, the house that Babe Ruth built, opened in the Bronx. On April 18th, 1942, Lieutenant Colonel James Jimmy Doolittle of the United States Army Air Force led the first American bombing raid on Tokyo. 
On April 18, 1955, Albert Einstein died in Princeton, New Jersey. Exactly one year before, on April 18, 1954, 54 miles to the northeast in Brooklyn, New York, I was born, which explains my affection for the date April 18th. But for our purposes, the big event on April 18th, specifically April 18th, 1906, occurred in the San Francisco Bay Area. At 5.12 a.m. local time, an estimated 7.8 magnitude earthquake occurred on the San Andreas Fault at a depth of five miles, its epicenter two miles offshore, just west of San Francisco. Radiating outward from there, the earthquake ruptured the San Andreas Fault for 296 miles. It was felt from Oregon in the north to Los Angeles in the south and all the way to central Nevada to the east. On either side of the fault line, the earth was displaced by as much as 28 feet. In San Francisco, the earthquake and subsequent fire killed roughly 3,000 people and destroyed some 490 city blocks and 25 thousand buildings. At the time of the quake, San Francisco was the jewel, the queen city of the American West. With a population of approximately 410,000, it was the most populous city as well as the financial and cultural capital of the Western United States. San Francisco's buildings were the tallest, its restaurants the finest, its entertainments the most varied and risque, and its factories the most productive in all of the western United States. Back to Enrico Caruso. As we observed moments ago, after having gone to bed on the night of April 17th, 1906, happy and contented, after a brilliant performance of Bizet's Carmen, Caruso did not wake up on April 18th either happy or contented. We quote the man himself. Quote, what an awakening! On Wednesday morning I wake up about five o'clock, feeling my bed rocking as though I am in a ship on the ocean, and for a moment I think I am dreaming that I am crossing the water on my way to my beautiful country and so I take no notice for the moment. And then, as the rocking continues, I get up and go to the window, raise the shade and look out. And what I see makes me tremble with fear. I see the buildings toppling over, big pieces of masonry falling, and from the street below I hear the cries and screams of men and women and children." Unquote. There are various descriptions of what happened next. One of them has Caruso brandishing an inscribed and signed portrait of then-President Teddy Roosevelt, thanks to which the military police allowed him to leave the city. Another story has him walking calmly from his hotel, the Palace, to the St. Francis Hotel, ordering and eating a breakfast of bacon and eggs and tipping the cook, a gent named Charlie Olson, $2.50. Yet another story has Caruso sitting on one of his steamer trunks, sobbing uncontrollably, while another describes him as running around outside his hotel, quote, half crazed, unquote. Here's what we do know. Caruso's trusty valet, Martino, got him dressed and safely out of the hotel, and then managed to retrieve Caruso's baggage before the presumably fireproof palace hotel burned. They spent the night on the ground at San Francisco's Union Square. Early the next day, safely banded together, the Metropolitan Opera Company crossed San Francisco Bay by ferry to Oakland, 
where they headed to the 16th Street train station. We'll let Caruso finish the story. Quote, When we arrive at Oakland, we find a train which is just about to start. The officials are very polite, take charge of my luggage, and tell me to get on board, which I am very glad to do. The trip to New York seems very long and tedious, and I sleep very little, for I can still feel the terrible rocking which made me sick. Even now, I can only sleep an hour at a time, for the experience was a terrible one." Unquote. For the Metropolitan Opera Traveling Company, it was a time of mixed blessings. Incredibly, not a single member of the company was badly hurt. But the famed Grand Opera House at Number 2 Mission Street burned to the ground, and the Metropolitan Opera's sets, properties, costumes, and most of the instruments belonging to its musicians were reduced to cinders. And Caruso? His groundbreaking performance as Don Jose and Carmen notwithstanding, he swore never to return to San Francisco. Caruso made good on his pledge, although, thankfully, another noted singer of Italian heritage, Anthony Dominic Benedetto, also known as Tony Bennett, subsequently made San Francisco his second home, leaving not his nerve, but rather his heart in the city. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.